Welcome to Indigenous Threads and Luisa Castañeda. This season is dedicated to Indigenous women and climate change. Today's episode is focused on the African region. We have a very special guest, Marian Walet Abubakri, who is a Tuareg indigenous woman from Timbuktu, Mali. And Marian is currently one of the six co principals investigators of Amar Aramat project. Welcome, Marian, and thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Marian, we're going to talk about uh, your people, the Tuareg people today and other peoples in, in Africa. And I would like to start this dialogue by asking you about your people, where they are located, livelihoods, and perhaps you can share with us uh, a story of origin of your people. Thank you so much, Luisa, for having me and for... Um, introducing new ways of for voices of indigenous peoples within McGill University. So Talasam, which means greetings in my language, Tamashak. So my people are the Tuareg people from the region of Sahel and Sahara in West and part of North Africa. Uh, my people use um, to live in a same territory, that block that is named from our language, depending in which part you are or which um, Tamashak you speak, because we have different Tamashakin. So that region is called Teneri, which means desert, or Adar, or Ahagar, or Fizan. So there are different nomination of our territory, but our territory uh, has been uh, divided after the colonization. Uh, so when the decolonization wave came in Africa in the uh, 1960, so for most of the African people, that was a joy, but for some of indigenous peoples in Africa, that was really a start of new colonization, a, a dislocation of our people among countries. So now, for example, my people, the Tuareg, or Keltamasha, as we name ourselves, founded ourselves in five countries, Algeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and Libya, where we become minorities in our own territory because now we are related to the post-colonial, these post-colonial states. Unfortunately, this is not only the case of uh, Keltamasha or Tuareg, but it's also the case of several other indigenous peoples in Africa. Maybe if I may ask, add more, because I remember now uh, about the other part of your question regarding the livelihood. So when I said Sahel and Sahara, that suggests pastoralism, it suggests herding. So we are people living Uh, very closely with our cattle, the camels. So we are nomad people, mostly nomad people before the colonization. But some of us also managed to also do some farming around the oasis, so where there is water, so it's not new. Not all the Tuareg people are only nomad pastoralists, but some of them also do small farming. That is how, for example, we have very famous farms of dates, the, the, the fruit that is eaten, for example, in this month of Ramadan, because we are having this uh, show in, during the Ramadan. But we have also over specific cereals that comes from this kind of resilient lands of desert uh, or of Sahara, where the regions are Uh, more arid, having less water. So I think that's how I can introduce very briefly my people and our way of uh, living. Thank you so much, uh, Marian. We are going to hear more about the Tuareg people in the coming questions. 
Now that we are entering this topic of climate change, we know that climate change is affecting everywhere, everyone, but particularly indigenous people who are at the front line. Despite of the low contribution of greenhouse uh, gas emissions in Africa, indigenous people, the region remains in a situation of vulnerability and also the, the indigenous peoples. We will be great, Marian, if you tell us how climate change is impacting your region in Africa and particularly your people. And you said that Tuareg people are pastoralists and they are nomadic people. So perhaps you can tell us what are the bigger challenges for them. Thank you. Indeed, the climate change crisis is very uh, is highly impacting indigenous peoples across the world. And when it comes to speak more specifically about my own people and how it affecting them, like there are all, several ways and different dimension of our life that is affected by the impact of the climate change. For example, you know. As I said, we are pastoralists, so and we live in arid areas. So the Sahel, the average of rainwater is very low. So that is one of the definition, even sometime yearly less than 100 millimeter per year. So it's very, very small quantity of water that we receive, but the environment and the biodiversity on those land really depend on the small quantity of water that we receive. And there is all chain of life that depend on that uh, small quantity of rain. But also the way that life is uh, managed depend on that. For example, we, for the pastoralism, used to move uh, on a specific season during just before the rainy season, which used to be June to September. So there would be people going to pastor's land where we used to use as pastor lands. We would send some messengers to go and check the space if it is enough wealthy for people, for animals. So unfortunately, this cycle of pastoralism movement is no longer very, very uh, predictable because climate change brought this change of seasons. We, we would see the beginning of the rainy season being more and more late, but also coming in a very heavy rains, which become unsafe for people because not always, but some of the area that are chosen for the pastoralism are the kind of very deep areas where we can have some water stagnation. It's kind of, it's not river, it's not lake, but it's um, kind of a small in French, we say cuve, but yeah. So when there is a heavy rain, there is a risk, for example, of flooding that may affect people, animal, but also vegetal species. So that is one of the direct impacts. So we don't know how, when to move for the pastoralism movement, which is not a fortunate movement. Like we do used to have a cycle to follow on that. And we don't really move far in the in those movements it's in a very small rayon but now as the rain season become unpredictable in terms of time but also in terms of um, quantity of water so people now the pastoralists move to far lands which uh, even goes beyond uh, their uh, traditional territory and that has over impacts that like uh, the intercommunity conflicts but also being moving so far from your community so there are some duties that you are not fulfilling from home and uh, the animals and the people become tired by moving too far with all the risks that are ongoing in our area uh, of insecurity, which is not only linked to the climate change, but 
to over geopolitical issue ongoing there. So uh, that is very, very summarized the direct impact. But then when I say now that the pastor's uh, movement becomes uncertain and predictable, that uh, also impacts the species we use, for example, the plant that grows for our medicines, the milk or the overproduct that come from the animals. All our, of our things come from the most of our products that either we eat or we decorate our houses. A lot of things come from the animal production. So if that is uh, treating our culture, including food culture, me medicinal culture also are treated. So that is very globally what I may, I may say on impact. May I ask you something? Because you say that now the pastoralists are going like beyond where they used to go. And this is causing some conflicts among indigenous people and the people living around these villages. I want to ask you, because the, your people are in five countries, as you mentioned earlier, how the establishing of borders are increasing more or have increased more challenges for indigenous people, even in the context for climate change, if they are able to cross borders because they have to find water and the land for their cattle and for them. So it has been some issues around that? Well, uh, for example, in the case of West Africa, because when I started, I told you that we are not only part of one region of Africa, like we are in West and in uh, North Africa, a part of North Africa, uh, the Southern part of North Africa and the Northern part of West Africa. That is where my people are. And there has been long time, not only f about the climate change, but also about the relation between people from one side to another side of the borders. So uh, having new borders now have, has affected people. But the good thing is this part of the these countries are not really under control or well controlled by the border customs because it's huge territory, it's wide territory. So the border customs would be in a very small part. And the people from my land, the Tuareg, they are the ones that really mastered the desert. So we know everywhere from the desert, we don't need GPS we know how to guide and how to find our way there. So that is the good thing. It didn't limit our movement around or between borders of our own country. But where the impact has come is that, as I said, our area is becoming more and more dry. Uh, and then we are sometimes, some of our people uh, move to more green land where there is more grass. So that is where the issue starts. And yes, there has been regulations for a long time to try to find like pastoralism corridors. And for example, for the West Africa, we have SILS. Uh, I don't know the mean of the acronym in English, but it's an, an organization, a regional organization, which regulate, for example, the movement of products, but more specifically of the pastoralism in West Africa. So there has been policies for a long time, but they are not really up to date and they are not focused really on indigenous peoples and their rights to self-determination or right to a territory. But it's a good one, at least if we look into Africa in general and into region. Again, the all the laws that are existing or rules uh, or jurisprudences in Africa and especially in the West African region are under threat because of the uh, new I will put it into game, like in into brackets, sorry, in the new conflict era that we are crossing now, because now it's more than 10 years ago that some of the countries failed in West Africa with no border control, nothing. And that is, the situation is worsening now because there are more countries that become failed, like uh, it used to be Mali, now Burkina Faso also. And we knew that we saw some 
period of insecurity also reaching even the Gulf of Guinea like Togo and uh, Benin. So that is a very threatening situation to pastoralist uh, movement like uh, displacement but also to improve the uh, existing laws that allows for example the transhumance movement. <laughs> You spoke about the, the general impacts of climate change on indigenous peoples. And I, will, I would like to ask you if you see specific impacts on indigenous women or how climate change is posing more barriers and challenges for indigenous women. Yeah, that is an interesting topic because I am uh, co-drafting uh, a study on environmental impact on indigenous women, specifically from our uh, land. And uh, one of the things that came from the study, which is not re yet published, is that there are several impacts. For example, when I said that land is becoming more and more uh, arid, it was already arid. That is one of the definition of the Sahel or classification, but also of Sahara. But the uh, land is becoming more and more dry. That means for women, like uh, having to cope with the issue of access to water, when we know that the women mostly are the one that are either directly in charge of taking water, going after water, or at least managing the food security of the of the family and of the community. For the Tuareg people, like it's cliche that you would see like women with a cup on their head in Africa, but we uh, as Tuareg women, it's a bit different. Like it's not the women who go for after water, it's men. But at after, we have the, as I said, the other task, which is really all the management task of resources. And that is under women, like what are you going to eat? Are we having enough to drink? Uh, who is sick, are we having medicines? So these non-valuable tasks, <laughs> non-economic um, counting, they are not counting economically, but they are heavy on mental and physical health uh, of women. So that is one of, I think, the burden or the impact of climate change directly on women. The second thing is uh, on their practice because they are the one who take care of the vulnerable people in the community. For example, someone who is sick, someone who is elderly, someone who is young, very young like kids. So they are the one who take care of them and uh, taking care of them would be feeding them and as now the food either from the animal, as I said, we feed ourselves from mainly animal products, either meat, cheese, or over so they are the one involved in those tasks and the food available become more and more less like more and more uh, difficult to get so that is a problem for women the other thing would be also the access to medicines to traditional medicine because there, we have some men healers but it's not very common in our community most of the healers the traditional healers are women so their medicine medicines also mainly comes from surrounding vegetable product like leaves, tissue, like different parts of the plant. And uh, those plants become, and those ingredients become more and more difficult to find. They would go far and far, uh, more and more far to get them. And that is an issue for women. So mainly that's what I can say, but there is also the cultural dimension because we have a very well-known music instrument which is kind of a drum but it's not drum that women use not only for music we call it in our language tende so uh, tende or tashijalt depending on which part of Tuareg land you are and this is made from one of the local wood 
and it's uh, serving as not only a music instrument but also a, to ground the cereals like millet or other cereals, the fonio that we find in our area. So these materials also are less easy to get now and it's impacting the gathering of women either to just share, have a sharing uh, moment because after the work day, they would gather and have fun with that. So if the fun part of life is a way that is impacting also mental health, but also our spirituality, but not also only that the transmission of that knowledge also is impacted. So that is very broadly uh, one of the quick impact I may share. For sure, there are a lot of others that uh, have been reported by the women we have been in conversation with during our study. And besides the climate change, because just, you know, how us is impacting clearly indigenous women, there are other challenges. Like, for instance, you, you mentioned that about the, the conflicts that are going on in some regions in Africa. But also, I wanted to ask you, there are like extractivism, pollution of water, criminalization. Are there other issues that indigenous people are facing that are added to the context of climate change that, of course, pose them in a very difficult situation? Yeah, I think now one of the more very impactful things for Tuareg women in most of the countries they found themselves in. In Niger is better, but I cannot say they are not impacted, but it's a bit better now. And in Algeria also is better, but for the other parts where they are, we are mostly impacted uh, by the conflict, by the insecurity that is going on for a long time now. As I was saying, for some areas, it's more than 10 years now. So imagine there are kids that was born, sorry, in refugee camps. So there are refugee camps of Tuareg people existing for 10 years now. And those kids can't uh, imagine a future without uh, those refugees come, they don't have hope. They are uh, for sure like uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees is trying and over UN organizations because they land on them are uh, doing their best and all the people who contribute to the fund of those organizations because they are mostly funded by people like you and me. <laughs> But the issue is, despite all the effort made there, those kids are missing their culture, their land, the hope of uh, like projecting themselves uh, one day in their own territory or having responsibilities within their own territory. So that is something that is really impacting our people, kids, elders, women, men, leaders. So if we come back to women more specifically, they are made more vulnerable now in refugees camp because these camps are crowded and that uh, put them in a vulnerability for uh, rape, for being used as any kind of weapon, but also putting them in some kind, either they find themselves in refugee camps or outside, because most of the people wouldn't go outside of their own country. They become internal displaced, what we call IDPs. So they would move from an secure part of the country to more secure part. Secure, uh, I will put it into bracket because if you m move to a big city, for example, you fall into the vulnerability because you are a young woman or not coming from fast, so you would compromise to maybe being in a relation with a man that is not a choice for you, but you want to like be able to eat, uh, maybe sending some money to your family. So there are a lot of cases of this situation reported or unreported, I will say, because they are not really reported officially. They are not told and they are not given vo enough voices. So that is another impact because of the ongoing insecurity situation yeah, on our land. So it's one of the 
living and very impactful issues that we are facing now. Thank you, Marian. I have two questions left, and one came to my mind because as a lawyer, I'm very interested in these topics. It's about the lack of legal recognition of indigenous peoples in most countries in Africa. So how is that the situation? How do you see it and in the context of climate change? Yeah, in general, that is a very uh, regrettable situation and it's a barrier for the recognition or for the implementation of the right of indigenous peoples in Africa. Uh, and uh, a part of that is uh, what I explained in the beginning, which is the impact of decolonization. So the African state was taught decolonize it, but uh, during that decolonization, our rights as indigenous people were not taken into account and that uh, wound stayed for now and it is the, a very impactful issue for us and for our recognition as such. I think in Africa there is a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of indigeneity because in Africa the indigeneity has been interpreted as a priority or anteriority on the land. Even if that is true for some of the indigenous people, for example the Tuareg, if you go to the Ahagar or to Ajer, which is located somewhere in current uh, southern Algeria, northeast of Mali. So you would find graphic that on the Rockies that are backdated 3,000 years with our writing system, the animal and our way of life on the Rockies. So there is no doubt that these people are the first people uh, of the, this part of the world. The same for the pygmy people, for example, in the Basin du Congo. But the problem of Africa is we should have that uh, open mind in understanding indigenity. It's not only the anteriority on the land because Africa knew local emperor invasions like the same empire would go from for example actual Guinea Conakry to for example current Burkina Faso which is a very long uh, territory and it's uh, now um, new countries it's it's crossing about three countries, right? So those empire and the people related to those empire cannot say we are indigenous to Guinea, to Mali, or to Cote d'Ivoire, or to Burkina Faso. They are for all those countries. And which is right, you know, depending on the time uh, when that happened, right? So that is the issue of how indigeneity has been misinterpreted in Africa. The second thing is um, for uh, African countries, post-colonial countries or states, sorry, one of the issues with indigenous people's rights has been always the self-determination. So when we recognize those people as people, automatically they would have the right to determine how they want to live their own institutions, their own governance system, and maybe splitting like a divide, division of country. That is the big apprehension for those countries or those states. And that is the real problem. I think it's really important to put things in their place. Now that we found ourselves in those countries, and now I am speaking as Maria, is that uh, we saw a lot of great examples of self-determination of indigenous peoples uh, within different countries. So uh, we have the example of uh, one P people. We have example of several First Nations in North America, Unudanga uh, and over. And it's important to just imagine that as a way for countries to be able to fulfill their part of international law. Because we have the United Nations Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Peoples. We have the ILO Convention 169, even if some people, if some countries didn't uh, ratify it. But at least they are the minimum standards for the implementation and fulfillment of the right of indigenous peoples who are anyway part of your states. So thinking of, for example, implementing the 
Sustainable Development Goals, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, UN DRIP and ILO Conventions 169 are just ways to be sure that indigenous peoples are not left behind within the implementation of basic rights. So there is no choice. Like if you want to pretend that you are a country or a state that is respecting human rights, you should respect indigenous people's rights. And those rights are not only the self-determination, but it's uh, the self-determination is the foundation of those ones. And it, it is a, a very big, I will say, range of rights that should be implemented. And yeah, I think in our region, we felt the recognition, but also in, the, in trying to find ways to adapt the implementation of those rights to uh, indigenous peoples. But having said that, I want to acknowledge that there have been some trying in, uh, within the African Commission on Human Rights and Peoples. They had uh, even uh, the African Working Group on Indigenous Populations, which exists, but which is really underfunded. I think, uh, and I call African states to really give more stage to indigenous peoples in Africa. We are here, like we are very open-minded people and uh, we would like to contribute to a greater Africa for all, where no one is marginalized and where everyone has her skills being acknowledged and every people's contribution is uh, valued also. Marian, it's very inspiring listening to all your, your insights. And I wanted to close this session with one last question. And is that we have talked about the challenges that indigenous peoples are facing, um, particularly indigenous women too. But for sure, we have seen that in many parts of the world that indigenous people are contributing to mitigate or combat climate change. I would like to ask you, you know, some experiences in your region or with your people that have been important to cope with the climate change and also so positive experience and not to, to have all the, in the negative. Um, there have been several experiences. I would not uh, pretend knowing all of them or the most impactful one or because to be frank, I am not really updated on everything happening and what is the challenge in Africa also is that a lot of work is done by, by indigenous peoples, women, men, but they are not voiced so I may not be aware of very great initiatives that are going on people's own land. But one of the things that I was aware of was organized by uh, one of our um, organizations, Tinhinan, and the women in a very small area in Mali, which is near Bangikoro. It's very small in the region of Timbuktu. So we have the acacia, which is one of the resilient plants. So there are several species of acacia, but one of them. So we use it as shelter, as yard to protect our animals so they are not going. We use uh, its product also to clean the teeth. We use it also to feed the small animals like uh, the goats. So it has also like medicinal uses. It has also fruits that are used in, in medicine, in even modern pharmacy. Uh, and it's also our candies. Just to tell you, it's very widely used. Like it's important and it's very resilient. It's not needed a lot of water to survive, right? So there are women get together by themselves. They are part of that organization. Without any funding for the first time, they started to plant a lot of acacias and by themselves. And then after that, uh, we found this very small fund through the International Forum of Indigenous Women. You know, they have small grants, uh, about $5,000, funded those women and give an incentive to the women through Tinhinan Steel and uh, they were even awarded for that. So I think that was a very great initiative that didn't have like big impact of sequestration of dioxide of carbon. 
but uh, at least locally it had an impact and it, it will have impact on these women practice access to medicine protection of their animals uh, feeding their animals and so and so so that is for me this kind of initiative are small not voiced but very impactful locally thank you well those are the initiatives that are worth it because at the end we need to cope with climate change at, at the local level and this is very inspiring and I wanted to thank you Mariam for taking the time I know you you made a great effort to being here today and thank you so much for all the work on behalf of indigenous peoples and thank you so much thank you This has been Indigenous Threats, a podcast series promoted by McGill University's Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned.